Generation Z, they're sad to be the saddest, loneliest, and most mentally fragile age group to date. How can it be that this generation that is supposed to be the most liberated, social, and wealthy generation ever is cursed with rising rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide? Where is youth culture heading? Let's talk about it. Before we dive into the problems surrounding Generation Z, I feel like I might have to make a little bit of a disclaimer here that I'm fully aware of the fact that I'll probably be sounding like a total boomer all throughout this video. But actually, that's exactly the reason I wanted to do this video in the first place. I was talking to my younger brother and his friends the other day, and at times I quite literally felt like I couldn't really keep up with their conversations. Um, I don't use the apps they use, the games they play, and frankly, they also seem to be interested in quite different things than what we were interested in right after we came out of high school. The age difference between me and my brother? Only four years. I was born in 1996, which makes me a bit of an in-betweener in a generational sense. But according to most sources, kids born in 1996 are in fact the last ones to be considered millennials. Everybody born after that, so from 1997 onwards, falls into that new category called Generation Z. So this made me wonder, why is there such a stark, noticeable difference between my generation and that of my only four-year younger brother? One of the possible explanations that I could immediately think of must be smartphones. The first gadget that I used throughout my childhood was first a Walkman, then at some point an mp3 player, and eventually, which was really cool, an iPod. It wasn't until 2012 or so that smartphones became widely used. I remember that I was actually in my last year of high school when I got my first iPhone, and I posted my first picture on Instagram when I was 17. Most gener Generation Z kids, however, spent most of their childhood, or at least their puberty, with smartphones and tablets in their hands. So they've been exposed to the World Wide Web basically every single second of every single day. I mean, I don't have to tell you about the negative effects of social media. We all know that being bombarded with perfect images all the time doesn't do much good to teenagers who are going through puberty. Take self-image. I can honestly say that I'm incredibly happy that I didn't have to go through my ugly puberty phase in a time of Instagram. As we all know, Instagram is filled with influencers who have the perfect selfie game totally maximized. Highly unattainable body shapes, sometimes achieved through Photoshop, but also through cosmetic enhancement, especially seem to be an issue here. To an extent, this is something of all times. When I grew up, we looked at Hollywood actresses and singers, and we obviously dreamt of looking like them. But the fact that they were part of Hollywood gave them a sort of unattainability, which also distances your self-image from them in a way. Nowadays, girls look up to influencers that often don't influence anybody for the better. And anyone can nowadays become an influencer, of course. Looking like a Hollywood celebrity, therefore, is easy if you have the money to do so. Because everything that you can possibly think of nowadays can be tweaked. It's not about being just fat or skinny anymore, as I used to think when I grew up. The issue here is that these procedures, these cosmetics procedures, are widely accessible at this point. But sometimes, if they're done well, they're very, very hard to detect. Young girls growing up with Instagram can have sometimes even no idea whether someone is real or not, and whether they have to set a certain expectation for themselves based on the images that they're seeing. And clearly, I'm not the only one who's seeing this. This is a topic that's now actually quite trendy to talk about. Many of the woke feminists speak about these unattainable beauty standards as a problematic element of our patriarchal society. And so, of course, a counter movement has begun. But as per usual, the woke mob takes it too far yet again, which has created this sort of really schizophrenic dichotomy between the perfect Instagram girls that we see everywhere and the everyone is beautiful the way they are type of slogans that we then see presented on the woke capital as well. And as per usual, the beauty industry, Hollywood and fashion brands have all jumped on the bandwagon because it makes money. 
As we all know, you can't see a commercial anymore without it countering the patriarchal standard in some way, shape or form. But apart from this quite visible effect, so to say, most of the effects of being on your phone all the time are more silent killers. The largest one, quite frankly put, is that it makes us antisocial and stupid. It's estimated that Generation Z spends up to a staggering nine hours per day on their phones. And this was pre-COVID. With most of the Western world being in lockdown for over a year now, phone usage is estimated to have increased by 45% on top of that. But Generation Z really didn't need COVID to social distance. They were already doing it before. 54% of Generation Z report anxiety and nervousness, according to researchers at the American Psychological Association. This is compared with only 40% of millennials, which is clearly also very high, but still it's way closer to the 34% national average in the US. Naturally, Gen Z is therefore also less interested in things like alcohol, partying, and even sex. Although Gen Z is supposed to be the most sexually liberated generation to have ever lived, they are actually behaving quite socially conservative in real life. Not so much online though. Relatively new apps mostly used by Gen Z, like TikTok and OnlyFans, are primary examples of that. TikTok is filled with barely dressed, often underage girls, lip syncing and doing stupid sexually tinted dances to pop music. OnlyFans is an app that allowed creators to sell their content to people who are willing to pay for personalized material. Basically, the app allowed people to sell their sexually graphic content to strangers on the internet. There are stories everywhere online of women that are, that are saying that they earn over tens of thousands of euros a month from posting their nude content to OnlyFans. So the generation that is exposed to very sexually graphic images, songs and films are in fact not interested in having sex themselves. Hmm, why would that be? The desensitization that is a consequence of non-stop phone usage doesn't just affect our social life, it affects our brain capacity too. One study found that mobile phone usage for as little as five minutes a day can cause significant memory impairment in humans. I mean, which makes sense. We don't have to remember anything. Where once repetition was the mother of knowledge, now Google is. And this clearly has an effect. Two-year-olds are able to unlock an iPad before they can form proper sentences, let alone before they can read. And because our attention span shrinks, people, especially younger generations, don't read much anymore. I know I myself am definitely guilty of this too, but the effects aren't to be underestimated. In the Netherlands, a fourth of all 15 year olds now, according to normal standards, are deemed to be such bad readers that they cannot understand simple everyday texts. So instead of encouraging kids to read, our institutions just lowered the bar. A recent example, a new edition of Anne Frank's diary has been published in simplified Dutch so that teenagers can better understand it. Mind you, Anne Frank herself started writing her diary when she was only 13 years old. And the thing is, the people who created all of these apps and these social media are well aware of the negative effects that they have on kids. And that's why they're making it a mission to keep it away from whom? Exactly, their own kids. Silicon Valley parents are sending their kids to expensive private schools where all forms of technology are banned. Another classic case of do as I say, not as I do. Clearly, big tech controls content that we get to see on a daily basis, which can very much shape a person's worldview, especially when they're young. Although it's quite normal, of course, for young people to lean a little bit towards the left, Generation Z is, let's just say, very woke. According to Pew Research Center, Generation Z is progressive and pro-government. They see growing racial and ethnic diversity as a good thing, and they're less likely than older generations to see their home country as superior to other nations. A look at how Generation Z voters view Trump, for example, provides further insight in how they see the world. 
About a quarter of registered voters in the United States, ages 18 up to 23, approved of how Donald Trump handled his job as president, while about three quarters disapproved. Gen Z sees themselves as being very politically aware. The issues they say to care most about are climate, racial inequality, and surprise, feminism. But Gen Zers, listen up. Saying and doing the exact same thing big tech and the woke capital wants you to say and do doesn't make you a rebel. It makes you a useful idiot. Really, if you want to change society, you will have to do more than post a black square on your Instagram. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Let's Talk About It. I hope you enjoyed my boomer rant this time. I know it was a little bit of a, maybe a weird take for a millennial to do, but still, let me know in the comments whether you liked it, yes or no, and make sure to like this video if you did. See you next time.